Hi guys, my name is DHS Studios and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be showing a clip of my new feature videos that I've got coming out in the next couple of months and that is called Forging the Cybermen. It's basically a timeline of the Cybermen from classics to new who and looking at their designs and how their stories have evolved and all that kind of stuff and trying to make a engaging and possibly funny script. So I do hope you enjoy it and I really wanted to bring something out on this day, uh, because it's Doctor Who Day, obviously, um, but most of it was because I'm just incredibly excited to to get it out and show people what I've been working on over the last couple of months. So I hope that you enjoy it and uh, look forward to the full thing. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then we'll begin. The cyborg's first appearance was in William Hartnell's final story, The Tenth Planet. I won't go into the reasons why the Doctor was regenerating, but it's definitely a momentous serial. Let's go back to season four in 1966. The Doctor, Ben and Polly have traveled to Antarctica December 1986, but this is no Christmas party. The Antarctic base is supervising a space probe called Zeus IV. As this is Doctor Who, it's not all going according to plan. A routine space mission comes into danger when the astronauts are drawn off course. The Doctor blames this on the gravitational pull of the Earth's lost long twin planet called Mondas, aka the Tenth Planet. The Tenth Planet is a term used by NASA to describe many other planets as well. I was always told for some reason that Pluto was the Tenth Planet. Um, but I, I couldn't find much about that. But one name keeps popping up, and that name is Eris. Sadly, there are no life signs on this planet. Well, that we know of. The episode indulges in real science. This is because Kit Pedler, the co-writer of the story, is a doctor of medicine. That doesn't mean that he understands quantum physics, but I'm sure that he's very knowledgeable in science in general. I actually did medical history in science, and uh, it was completely useless. It was awful. But now I know that if I get a cold, I just put a plus on the door and pray for forgiveness. But I failed history completely, so... It wasn't even my fault because all of the questions were ridiculously difficult. They were all about keeping up with the Normans. And obviously, we spent all of our time learning about the big battles that take up most of the course, when really we should have focused all on that half lesson that we spent on it. When it came to writing the episode, Pedler was inspired by a subject he feared. The idea of what makes something human, the idea that you can replace body parts with metal components in order to live longer and all that kind of stuff. In a very loosely linked way, cyborgs exist in our time. Some people need them to be able to function. In some cases, it can be your mobility. For example, hip replacements are inserting metal into the body, which made customs extremely difficult for my auntie. She couldn't just like whip that out. That doesn't make your nano with a dodgy hip have a taste of homicidal rage. It means that the idea of the Cybermen are real. Although, it's a lot less exaggerated. Ideas such as the Cybermen and the Borg, remember the Cybermen came first, are never really going to happen in our time because now we fear them. We don't want to be like the things that we've seen on television and movies, because Star Trek had movies. Before long, future generations could be replacing themselves with non-organic parts. Who knows, we might even have cures for things such as dementia and blindness by then. Now it is time that I talked about the Cybermen, dubbed the Mondasian Cybermen. This is the most human version we see, well at least in the TV show, in fact no we don't because we have Ashad, but I completely forgot about the Tardis children. It's ironic that I keep referring to them as the Cybermen when they have very little metal. Chest is always in the forefront as a reminder that they are not organic. The movement is also very robotic and heavy, but this may be because the suit itself was actually quite heavy and I imagine it'd be quite hard to see in those things if you ever tried walking around in one of those toy helmets um I imagine it would be a lot harder than that the metal helmets make you wonder what horrors it might be shielding the incomplete facial features on the masks represent the little amount of humanity they still have left eyes mouths that kind of stuff while still maintaining that chilling dead glare leading to a lot of hidden horror then there is a light on its head so it can see in dark places in reality, all the fabric on his face is just being held up by the big light. So much for hidden horror and more protecting the pennies. That is the best line you're gonna get throughout this entire thing, by the way. The gloves make the shoddy production even more apparent. These gloves were made by the costume designer, although they forgot to bring them when they first filmed the Cybermen. Instead of, you know, getting them, they were so strict with their scheduling that they had to film then and whatever was 
filmed had to be the final take. You could argue this was a smart way to show the human side of the Cybermen, but in reality, it was just a mess up. An actor who played one of the Cybermen described the creation as a case of trial and error. The whole episode was plagued with issues, but I'm sure I can make a long video on that another day.